Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. This is Nick Pope, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network. And this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Hello, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. Um, right, hopefully we've got another good show for you today. I've got a fantastic author, author for you. Uh, his name is Paul Sinclair. He's, he's had two um, really good selling books out, uh, Truth Proof, and there's, a, he's, there's another one just come out, Truth Proof 3. And uh, I'll just be in, inviting him on in just a moment. But before I do that, I'll just do my usual call outs for people. Uh, we've got Ken Jenkins, New York City, New York, USA. Uh, Ellie Richardson, Portsmouth, UK. And Bill Rook. York, UK. Now, hopefully, I'll be having Bill Rook on at some point, and we may even um, we may even mention Bill during this show because I think he has uh, experiences with light beings and things such as uh, the book that uh, Paul talks about. Um, anyway, I think the thing the best thing to do is uh, introduce Paul right now. Hello, Paul. Are you there? Hello there, David. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm here, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak on the show today. Uh, very good, and. Uh, Interesting, I need to say thank you to Nick Pope, because he wrote me a few words for the third book. So if he gets to hear this, thank you, Nick. Another yeah, one. Well, hopefully he will. I think he wrote on your, on your second one as well, didn't he, on the back? It, yeah, he has done, yeah. He's, he's really kind yeah, well, of... just it. looking at it now, yeah. He said, he said, a fascinating and disturbing collection of accounts, Nick Pope. Yeah, <laughs> so... Uh, it, you know, it's, it's quite nice when such a notable authors... Uh, such as Whitley Strieber and other people, take an interest, and, and Derek Tyler, I don't know if you've ever, ever had Derek on the show, if, I, if yeah, you haven't. Not yet, not yet but it's, it's a name in the frame. Yeah, fabulous guest he would make, you know, and they, they sort of, I wouldn't say credit your work, but they've, they've read it and think, yeah, that's worth giving a thumbs up, and I thank those people. But yeah. uh, as, as regards today, David, you just... Ask me whatever you want, and we'll just go whatever direction you want to take it. Yeah, well, okay, well I did mention your, your your first two books. You got Truth Proof. Uh, it says the truth that leaves no proof is your first book, was it? It came out a couple of years ago, didn't it? I think. Yeah, was it? 2016, yeah. and then we've got Truth Proof Two: Beyond the Thinking Mind, and then we're up, <laughs> sounds a bit simple, simplistic, isn't it? Truth Proof Three: Bringing Down the Light, yeah. and there will be a Truth. Oh, four listeners, I oh, assure you. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I've got to be honest, Paul, I haven't got your third one yet, but I am going to get it, all right? And I'll, and I'll, ex- I'll, and I'll, expect, I'll expect you to scribble on it for me, so... <laughs> well, it's only scribbly if I've done it, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. no, I, mean, I don't know where you want to take it, Paul. I mean, perhaps you'd like to tell us how you first got into um, ufology, if you will. You know, um, I, I, you, you used to run a website, didn't you? You still do? I, no, I haven't got the website. Well, there's a website, uh, if you can call it that. I'm, I, I, sort of, I don't do myself any favours because I'm not that brilliant with social media. So there's a website which is truthproof.webs.com. But before that, while I was, whilst I was working, I think from about 2002 to 2013, I had a website called ILF UFO, in, meaning the ILF was Intelligent Light Forms which is basically what I believe we've been viewing up on the East Yorkshire Wolds, around eastern North Yorkshire, the wolds of the larger expanses of land, open land and farmland, and with, you know, intermittent, the sparse woodland in between, and mainly sheep grazing, but you've got these strange spheres of light mm. that will just suddenly appear and punch into multiples of threes, fours and fives, and they're getting them over the sea as well, and no doubt we're dealing with the same phenomena, but what I've 
what I've found, David, and you know, I'm no expert on this. I, I'm, I'm same as everybody who's listening to this and everybody who goes to the conferences. I'm searching for answers. But repeat areas are showing time and time again, and I'm sort of naming them the multi-phenomena areas. And I'm, a, I'm a, so MFAs. I've I realised I've said phenomena as it with an F, but mm. I'm not really bothered about that. <laughs> and the, the what it seems though, David, is that these locations don't just throw up UFO sightings. And I think, uh, uh, you know, to sort of coin a phrase, a UFO investigator or, or researcher, I think we should throw net a lot wider and include everything i think we, we we're all missing a trick you know the the people who are into the the ghost aspect of it and the mm. poltergeist but because i think look, ultimately it's all linked no, i, I don't absolutely know. agree with you paul i mean i've said that on several i don't know if you've heard any previous shows but uh that's that's my idea well not my idea it's my that's my, the way i think as well i think um, the, a, a few years ago i couldn't see any links in it you know but over the, what, from what I've been hearing and sort of studying and reading about over the last sort of ten years or so, I really do agree with you. I think it's all linked. It's all connected somehow. Yeah, I mean, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not happening and it can't happen. I mean, uh, there's, there, there's too many people entrenched in in their box of research, shall we say? And I, yeah. I think that's I do. I think it's a mistake. I mean, if you want, if you jump to you know thousands of miles. Uh, to the other side of the world and looked at Skinwalker and you'll see that every type of phenomena is manifesting there from structured craft reported, uh, you know, over the years to animal mutilation to to cryptids to big cats so it would be, to me it, it would be stupid to think that there isn't a, co maybe location is the key, that's what I used to, uh, that's what I say in the first book and the second book location is key, because these things do seem to be appearing in and around the same locations constantly and it's, it would be interesting if we could get these multi-phenomena areas we know they're established in other parts of the world but if we could get researchers in other parts of the world to, to report when the alien big cats are being seen for instance because mm. we get that around eastern North Yorkshire David and, and it would be interesting if we could find out get, get some networking going to find out if in, in the other active areas the cats are being seen there as well and, uh, for instance, or if the UFOs are being seen, the light forms, um, for want of a better word, you know, these these spheres of, of light that I don't... We know Earth lights exist. I mean, that can't be denied. But I feel that the, the lights that we're observing over the sea, uh, off Bempton and Flamborough, there's an awareness to them. And, and I've spoke to too many trawlermen, rock anglers, seen them myself, not to think that these there's more to these things than, than just a, a, a random... Uh, you know the, uh, the movement of the earth uh, sure. thousands and thousands of feet below the surface uh, these things that seem to have the ability to switch on punch into a multiple of four five switch off and appear in a different part of the sky instantly and the, the, the they're in formation they're in lines that are equally spaced there's no randomness to them most of the time what they're about i don't know i mean whether whether there's anything interestingly in the next book, because uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm well on with the next one. Uh, I have a an incredible report from an, a contracts manager for for the MOD, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be using his his full name because he's allowed me to do this. And but this is we've we've moved out of Eastern North Yorkshire, and I'm sorry, listeners, if I'm rambling a little mm, bit, but this spoke <laughs> story. But it will give an as part of his job on this contract from um, from 2011 I believe it was he was given a, a a house to rent overlooking the sea this is in Cornwall and he contacted me to say he'd seen the spheres of light that he'd read about in the truth proof books and th that's that's what prompted him to contact me we've had lots of conversations but he, he got binoculars I powered binoculars on these lights and there were plenty of news coverage at the time people had seen them but he claims that inside the light he could see gold pyramids, hmm. which is, I, I, I just find it interesting. I mean, I've never observed anything like that inside them. But, I mean, this is, it's an evening sighting. It's not quite dark. As I say, and this guy's given me full permission to use his name in the book, which I will be doing. And the, the story's pretty terrifying, to be honest with you, because he had, an, he had, he had the most terrifying experience after the night he saw these these objects, these spheres of light over the sea, and he be he believes that that was to stop him talking about them. But uh, um, 
I don't, I don't know if I can talk about what happened to him on radio. I am going to write about it, but as I say, I've just gone on a, off on a tangent there, mm. David. You know, we, we, in the area that we're, we're in, in eastern North Yorkshire, there's, what I'm looking into at Bempton and Flamborough and for, a bit further up the coast, Speeton and Ravenscar and Filey, it's not new. This stuff goes back decades. It, it probably goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, yeah, you know. Yeah, so I've heard quite a few of the uh, stories. In, uh, about them, I mean, especially in your books as well. You you do highlight a lot of the historical um, incidents, don't you? Well, I, well, I think folklore is ma- folklore is is was what we once termed as science hmm. before science codified it and, and 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 tried to bring it into some kind of unity and fit it into boxes that we yeah. could understand. We're all folklore, David. We're all we're we're all sort of living folklore. I'm, and I, th- I think there's just because it's not the written word and people say, oh, stories get embellished. Well, of course they do. Yeah. But if the same stories are, are coming out today uh, that were coming out hundreds of years ago, then there has to be some substance to them. If we've got people still reporting, seeing an upright dog like creature around the areas of Flixton, uh, like like it's been reported for hundreds of years, then you think to yourself, hang on a minute, either all these people are liars or, or, or there's, there's an element of truth in this. Mm. And I've said it many times, David, on, you know, on radio shows, and, and I think I said it in the books as well, I don't actually believe that there's anything that could transform from a man to a beast. I don't, but that doesn't mean that I don't think that there isn't some truth to these stories, uh, because there's, there's too many people talking about it and, and coming out with these things. I mean, just recently... As early as uh, uh, February the 7th of this year, uh, I don't know whether you looked at the Bempton Phenomena, the documentary that me and Chris Turner did. Not yet. No, I'm looking forward well, to. Well, it, obviously you know that Chris did elusive about the the, the British cryptids, yeah. the dogman type creatures. Or the, I'm, I'm not really fond of the word dogman, although we're only playing with words, aren't we? I was actually and, going to ask you about this, but you might as well carry on and tell us about it now. Well, well, you know, I, mean, I think werewolf obviously conjures up images from movies and mm. underworld. People associate it with silver bullets. I mean, it's, it's hard to... I don't want to invent a new word for it, but I think we've got to stay with werewolf. I just wish people would maybe get away from the idea that there's some kind of transformation or from mm. a man or a woman to a beast. Because I, I believe there's something to it. I think the, the American uh, Indians have probably got the best idea with the skinwalkers believing this is a creature that can live between worlds. Mm. And, it, you know, and, it, and that's its ability to slip between our world and its own. Yeah, interdim- like interdimensional creature. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that that's what I... And, and, you know, I mean, I'm willing to be <laughs> convinced otherwise and I'm willing to be shown otherwise I'd, I'd, I'd love to but at the moment that's where I'm leaning because I believe it exists I, I, we've, for, for this latest documentary Bringing Down the Light we've spoke to a guy who lives in Caton and he was with his wife and he claims that this, this creature literally he saw it in his peripheral vision jumped to the front of a garden just on the edge of the Flixton and Caton cars that's the area of wetland that used to be once Lake Flixton in uh, Paleolithic times, that's 11,000 years ago, so it's a pretty remote area and there's a row of bungalows along the edge of the cars. From from one leap, this thing leapt into the middle of the road, and another leap, and it were over onto the cars. And he described this this wiry, thin creature that were far too long. Uh, it, it, everything went out of proportion with it. His, his legs operated like, like a canine's legs but he didn't describe it as having something like a wolf's head or anything and he's, he's adamant about what he saw and it's so much so and he's no mug this fella I mean I think he's highly qualified well I know he is mm. and he's gone on camera you know he's, 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 you get some people David and the, the, they're telling you the truth as you know mm. we've all come across them that's why we get people in the audiences at conferences myself included where they're coming, they're coming to, to listen to an experience because many of them have got fabulous experiences of their own, probably better than mine, better than yours, but they just don't want to talk about it. But So back to my point, this guy's willing to go on camera with his name and state what he's seen, and many people won't do that. We've got some on the, on the film that we've blurred their faces out. We've got a guy who claims he worked for the MOD at Bempton after it shut, and that's me and Chris have interviewed him for over an hour. And I'd spoken to him previously because I'd set the interview up. 
And this guy claims that his job was, first of all, he'd got some special abilities. And I'm not talking he could teleport or anything silly like that, but uh, I, I'm not, we, we've, it'll be in, it'll be in the documentary. But what I'm saying is he, he was employed after the base closed to spend time around the base trying to look for unexplained phenom- unexplained phenomena, which he never found. He never found nothing. He's quite open about that. He's quite truthful about the fact that he never found anything. But as his role working for the MOD or working it was, it was Air Force, actually, that's that was his job. And he, he comes out with some really interesting things. He's, a, he's an interesting guy. Let's put it that road. And nobody will have ever heard this man speak before. But when you do hear him speak, you realise you realise how interesting he is. Yeah, no, it <laughs> but, sounds, sounds fascinating. Yeah. It is. I mean, this guy claims that uh, the MOD or the, the, the powers that be already know that there's different species of... Uh, well, I'm reluctant to call them alien because I don't know where they come from. Mm. We call, but the three, they know at least that there was three different species manifesting or, or appearing around that area. And he didn't get, even get told the names of these things. He just, just got told one, two and three. Uh, and he claimed that they were coming through portals in the area. Now, once again, part of the job of doing this documentary is, is to get other people's stories. So I'm not saying I believe everything that somebody's told me, up, line and sinker. Uh, j- just like we've just been talking about this, the, you know, the accounts of the Flixton werewolf. Mm. All I do is, well, uh, me and Andy Ramsden, I don't know if you know Andy, yeah. David, I think you do, yeah? Yeah. We've seen something highly unusual at Bempton back in, I'm not sure if it were 2016 or 2017 that came from the edge of the cliff. And it was on all fours and it ran and it cleared a three bar fence and went up the field. And when we put a light on up the field, Andy became very scared that this, whatever it was, a big. Yeah, I think, yellow I, I think I've heard about this, but yeah, yeah. It, 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 it is in your it, book, isn't it? I think, I believe, yeah, I think I've read it. Thing, yeah. That's correct. It blinked and looked away and sort of dipped its head down and it, it weren't frightened of us, which draws. No. I mean, people might be thinking, well, these guys have seen a fox or a badger. Let me tell you, I've, I've spent years up here around foxes and badgers, uh, be, trying to, dis- try, we've been trying to find out what's slaughtering the livestock up at Bempton, uh, which stopped early this year because there's no longer livestock up there. They've mm. done with it. They can't take no much suffer any more losses. But because whatever was killing the livestock, and I realise, listeners, I'm jumping about all over the place here. I think I've just took David by surprise, listeners, today because uh, <laughs> I usually get uh, by surprise. It's all right. No, we, we didn't. We didn't plan this. Uh, it was. It's my fault entirely. But um, whatever's killing the livestock is is not really that interested in eating it. It wants to remove all the skin from the faces. Remove their eyes oh, well. and, I mean, and take the. So, is there, is there any connections with the uh, old uh, the, you know, like the, the horse mutilations and cattle mutilations that, uh, from years ago, like um, which uh, Milton Hell uh, investigated? Do you think well, they, Richard they D. Poss- Hall investigated a lot of it as well? They, they pro- possibly could be. We still haven't established what's what. Not even a clue what's doing it because whatever is is doing it, in my opinion, is is marine based as well because mm. when it when it got at its peak david and all the pictures are in the new book and i'll say all there's quite a lot of pictures that are quite graphic in the new book depicting what just what i've said i'm not just saying these things without the evidence because we did that on the bempton phenomena and we due to youtube we didn't show the images mm. that were the reason but people believe that we were just talking hot air well all the images are in the book and all the images will be in bringing down the light uh what 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 we were finding around the the edges of the cliffs and and on the on the shoreline very close were harbour porpoise you know the little dolphin type uh, yeah. mammals probably about four foot long but interesting injury to them what the, they'd got huge holes through their jaws mm. and we're talking three to four inch round holes you know sort of smashed through the jaws and no other signs of injury and inter- interestingly with the sheep. Um, usually the throat had been torn out, but the, 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 nothing had been eaten and there was no blood. You know, we, we were finding roe deer carcasses with heads removed, badgers with heads removed, but not just mm. heads removed, skinned around the waist as though they've got the shirt off. It's, I know it's, there's no easier way of saying it no. than that. Yeah. 
uh, macabre, really. And when you consider that a roadie is probably the fastest thing in UK and probably only dog to catch, it would be a greyhound. Well, you know when a... I'm sorry for sounding... If I'm a bit too macabre, David, you stop me. No, no, okay. Uh, uh, well, you know, if, if a dog's predated on a sheep or a, a deer, you're going to find puncture wounds, you're going to find bite, bite marks all over the animal. They're not, they're not very selective. They're not like a big cat which is calculated and, and knows what part of the animal to yeah. grab hold of. I know what you mean. They, they actually grab them, they, they'll get hold of them by the neck or wherever they can get hold of them, can't they? I, I yeah, that's correct. I've, I've actually yeah. had whippets in the past, so I know how they go after rabbits and things, and they just yeah, get hold of them wherever they can get hold of them. But what you've got here are animals that, that for want of a better word, have just been look like, they look like they've been killed instantly, mm. and uh, the eyes look look like they've been sucked out with a hoover. There's no trauma, mm. and the ears cut off, very very clean cut. So what's doing it? I don't know because I mean some people have suggested is it human? Is there a human element to it? Because as as people real know, I've probably in past talked about the satanic cult that once operated up at Area Bempton, and is it something to do with them? Well. Personally, I don't think so, because the locations where these animals have been found is very remote. And you'd have to get there, you'd have to use torches and that. And they would be seen by the farm, the farmers. I mean, when I'm talking about this amount of sheep, people have said to me, are police involved? Or I've heard people seen comments, well, police would be involved. Yeah, police are involved. They haven't got a clue what it is. They've sat up there with night, night scopes and... Uh, found one dead in the same field where they've had night scopes. The, huh. the police have not got a clue. Um, I don't know what's doing it. I wish I did. Uh, but whatever it is, it's it's land-based, it's it's marine-based, and it's capable of hitting these things. An absolute... Uh, there's 70, 80 kilo ewes. It's just devastating them. And there's lambs in the field as well. It's not really touching lambs. It seems to be the adult ewes. But as I say, they've gone now. There's none in the fields now. And... Uh, Thank God, because it's, it, it can't be... Well, it's a sudden death, but it's, mm. it's still well, tragic. Also, I mean, it's actually like a farmer's um, money as well, isn't it, if, that, that's being lost by it, if he's losing every, his stock. Every time one's hit, is lose... Yeah, and we've, we've... I mean, you don't know the area, David, but I, I did a bit of digging and I, I rang livestock auction houses and, and different places around the area... And it turns out that probably about 16 to 18 miles up the coast as the crow flies at Ravenscar, uh, a similar thing was happening there. All on the coast, though. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is on the edge of the sea, just like these these locations. And then if you went about 25, 24 miles down the coast towards Hull, uh, it was happening there at a place just 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 towards the coast off Sprotley. So. We weren't isolated. We weren't unique, but it was. It's the it's the nature of the injuries that's unique, mm. and I don't really understand it. I mean, there's there's no accounting for it. I mean, I th I became alerted to it on I think it was December, New Year's Day. It was New Year's Day, uh, 2018, because the 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 police officers had been to see a guy who lives in the Danes the Danes Dyke, a vagrant. He's lived there for 11 years. And they wanted to know if he'd seen any highly unusual animals whilst living in this, you know, in this woodland. And they told him. We went, we took the, the tramp some food, actually, and he, that's why I got to know about the story. And they told him that in the weeks previous, animals had been killed at Bempton. But when I found out about it, it turns out it had been going on all year. But they're very, they're quite secular and they don't really share much information with each other so you don't know what other farms it's happening to uh it's very difficult to just like uh, all close-knit communities just like in south yorkshire and other places where there's mining communities they they, they, they keep themselves to themselves and the, the, the farming stock are no different and the trawler men are no mm. different difficult to get information did um did much of that get in the newspapers or was there a sort of a, a cover-up going on do you think there's, I, I, I don't know whether I'd call it a cover-up, but there's been nothing in the newspapers. And interestingly enough, they know all about it. <laughs> the, yeah. the, but there's been... I mean, the newspaper a few months ago, the Bridlington Echo, uh, contacted me because there was a big cat scene. I can't remember the exact date. It'll probably be three months ago now. There's been a big black cat scene by numerous people at Buckton. And we're talking Labrador-sized cats, mm -hmm. which is interesting because... As we've said before, as I've said, location is key. And where's it been seen before? At Buckton over the years, 
you know, going back 10, 20, 30 years, people have reported seeing a cat around that time. I think it was March time at Buckton. So they, they asked me and then they did a little article and put a picture of me in. And I didn't know they were doing this. <laughs> But I, I know for a fact, anyway, that this guy knows all about the sheep. But they've not seriously. They've not. They've not ran it in papers or anything. But uh, um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, not, at, at the moment, not on local TV, definitely not on the local TV at all. Not, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Because hmm. they, 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 they I mean, it's, you know, I, I, it's quite a, a big local incident to be happening, isn't it? With all you know, with uh, animals well, being well, mutilated well, like that. When I found out about it. Uh, when the, the when the farmer first realised anything was wrong, because when I found out at, on New Year's Day, I managed to trace the farmer and I went to speak to him and I asked him if he'd let me look into it for him and, and I said it nothing. That's why I've not drawn no conclusions, David. I'm not one of these people that's going to turn around and go, oh, this has got to be alien related mm. or this is some kind of uh, land based unknown predator. It's, it's all up in the air. We, I really don't know what's responsible for it. Uh, and uh, but what's, what is interesting is that these lights are seen when a lot of the incidents take place. So that, that can't be denied. Even jumping from the sheep for a moment, well, even going back to 1970 and the, the crash of lightning XS 894 on September the 8th, 1970. What were XS 894 allegedly do, doing? It were pursuing a light and vanished from radar of five miles off Bempton. Mm. You know, I mean, the, the, the actual, uh, written work from other people might say it vanished from radar 20 miles uh, off Bempton, but it didn't. I've, I've got the lifeboat logs. I know, I know where it disappeared from. We're only splitting airs here, but what I'm saying is it was pursu it was allegedly pursuing a light. And I think there's a lot of information to, I'd jump off fence with XS894 and say I believe it's UFO related. But jumping back to the sheep and, and what's been happening, I, I told him, I, I, you know, I'm not going to form any conclusions, just let me try and find out what's happening. And I spent the best part of 18 months going up to those fields at, in between 4 and 5 a.m. Mm. Uh, and finding the carcasses, but never finding the culprit, never finding any evidence to say hu it was human activity or, or, or paranormal activity, if we want to just put that into some kind of big bowl and check it up, because I don't know what... But interestingly, after we did the Bempton Phenomena, David, uh, I, I don't normally look at comments. Or I look at the comments, but I don't normally reply to them because if you get if you start replying to them, if there's anything negative, you're just feeding whoever you're feeding them, and I'm not I'm not into that, that you know. Yeah. So so I don't really get involved. But this guy had told me he put in comments. He went, he says these blokes aren't lying. I've seen something at Bempton, and I think he said I've seen that were like from a nightmare. I don't know. There were he wrote a fair bit and. There was just an air in this chap's message, and I, so I messaged him. I said, I'd love to hear what you've seen. So it turns out that he'd actually written about it somewhere, and I found it on February the 7th, the day he came back. And they'd gone up to Bempton to do some wild camping. Uh, they're ex-military. Uh, they, you know, they, they wouldn't be in military now. They're getting on. They're in the late 40s. And uh, they were on cliff tops and he described where they were and he said they parked in the car park at the RSPB and he said he went through between he said when they went onto the cliff tops they took a right which meant that the fence stopping people falling over the cliffs was on the left and they're walking towards Flamborough and he's describing this he says and we lit a pair of yellow eyes up pinky yellow eyes which is sort of drew, instantly drew me to what me and Andy Ramsden saw he said and the dogs were with us he says and they wouldn't do anything, he says. It was strange. They wouldn't run about. They want they stuck with us, he says. And he he he, he, no, he also noted that the air felt off. He said it felt electric. He said it was weird. He says the airs on the back of my arms and on my neck were stuck up. He says we did we realised it felt strange. We realised it was surreally quiet. But obviously, it's only looking back when you start analysing it. That you know, so he said. So he's not on his own. He's with someone else. He said, and we lit these big yellow eyes up. He says, but this thing didn't act like a rabbit would act. It uh, like stuck in the headlights. It just sent to turn away. He said so. We carried on walking and lit these eyes up again, and it, it hadn't moved. He said, and then we came to what a viewing platform. And I'm bearing in mind this is this is in between three and four in the morning, and this guy's not familiar with area. They're from Liverpool. 
Uh, but they get all over doing little bits of this wild camping stuff. Anyway, so, and he'd not got a, an interest in any of this, David. I need to say this, that they weren't there for some paranormal experience or anything yeah. uh, re- remotely related. I think they're probably just reliving old times when the things they've done in the years in, in military. But anyway, so says, we came to a viewing platform, he says, and then about, I don't know, 50 to 75 foot away, there were two gate posts without a gate on. Well, I can picture these gate posts now. Uh, the big 8B8 posts, and they're not, they're, that's what it, basically what they are. They've never had a gate on. He said, and we walked towards the gate posts. I mean, this guy will probably listen to this because I've been speaking to him today. Uh, and we lit, we, we put the torch on, he says, and hunkered down. And and once again, please, listeners, and we're not trying to sell or bring down the light DVD here, but we'll be talking, we'll, no, but David, we'll be talking about this at the Awakening Conference, and we'll be playing the recording of what he's told me. So it's not just my words, uh, because I've asked him and he's allowed me to record him. He says, this thing was hunkered down, and he swore, but I'll not swear. He said, and he says, at first I thought it was a huge hyena. He said it had like a humped, hunched back, and all bristles on the back of its, on its back, all bristling the fur. He says, and then the next thing, it stood on two legs. He said, and this thing was seven foot tall. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I'm only relaying a story. Mm. I've not seen anything seven foot tall. He said, but he said it had a huge barrel chest on it, arms that were far too long for its body, even though it was long, and, and, and not over muscular, and, and hands, he says, it didn't have paws, it had hands with claws, he says, and it took a step towards us, it had a head full of teeth, ears like a Alsatian type things at the side of its head, and a, and a, a silvery fawn chest, and I said, yeah, and I, it, it was terrified, the other guy, the other guy, he, he just won't talk about it, this guy, He's, 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 you can feel the fear in his voice when he's talking about it and I've never spoke to anybody that I'm really being terrified when they've seen these things and anybody who's listened to any of the radio shows about the werewolves and the dog, alleged dogman sightings you'll nobody comes away with feeling that it were a nice thing to see not from what I've seen he says they backed away and, and went obviously they're, they're there to tell the story which leads me to think that there's some other intelligence here. I mean, I, I don't even know if it's something that's playing with our minds, you know, David. Mm, mm. Uh, as, in, as, in, as in projecting into our mind our worst nightmare, if that makes sense, because you would think an apex predator like that, it can't be living on Bem- at Bempton, regardless of the amount of caves and sea tunnels that there are below those cliffs. It, it, it would have been seen. Uh, we know we're getting glimpses of this thing, but there's years between the glimpses. Uh, we're getting glimpses of this thing at Flixton, but there's years between. Uh, so I can't believe that we wouldn't be seeing the is the carnage that it would leave in its wake. I mean, I asked him how much he thought this thing would weigh, and he estimated it would weigh 300 pounds. Now, that would need to consume a lot of food. Mm. When it were a carnivore, I mean, if it were omnivorous, it would have to be grazing fields, and it, nobody's reported seeing anything like that. I mean, these, these are, listeners, these are really off-the-wall stories, and I'm not asking anybody to... To necessarily take my word for it, and but, but but look at these things with an open mind and ask yourself, you know, if these people continue to report this stuff, totally independent from one another, then we've got to have a grain of truth in it. And like I've said, if just because science can't get its head round it, just because science says this can't exist and that can't possibly travel from that galaxy to here, well, it might they might not be travelling from that galaxy uh, to 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 yeah. Earth. They're already here. Yeah, exactly, my, exactly my, the way I think of it. Um, I think that there, there are extraterrestrials that do visit us, but I think a lot of it could be right here in a different uh, dimension plane, you know, um, on a different uh, vibration plane, even if you like. I would agree entirely. You know, I mean, we might just be one tweak away, and we're sat on Radio 1, and, and they're on Radio 2, and it's a sim- it could be as simple as that, just because we can't get our heads around it. I mean, yeah. the technology that some of these advanced we'll call them beings, might have, uh, it would it'd, it'd appear as magic to us. I mean, and it does appear like magic to us. Mm. I mean, you know, when we talked about the Hunnambi UFO landing, this is a case I'm looking into at the moment, David, 
But it's, it's, it's quite, it's incredible to me. It's incredible. But I mean, these guys at one stage during their series of events that went on from 96, 97 and 98, uh, well, one of the guys that uh, Steve claims that, excuse me, he saw three huge black triangles traveling towards him from the coast. Uh, to, to describe Hullenby, it's it's probably about three miles fr uh, as the crow flies from the coast, although you can't see the sea because it's down in a bit of a dip. And it, it were two guys from a, a neighbouring industrial unit a, a few doors down, and they're watching these things and discussing them there. And then at one point, Steve says, they're going to fly right over top of us. And as he'd said those words, these things switched off. They didn't fly away. Hmm. This sim that is exact words. They just switched off. One one moment they were there, one moment they weren't. Now you'd have thought something. These monstrously huge triangles. There were no navigation lights on them. There were no sound to them. But you would have thought that other people would have observed them. But it were almost like there was some kind of intermind connection with Steve's voice saying these things are going to fly right over the top of us, and an acknowledgement, and we're just. We're switching off. And some kind of, I don't know, cloaking ability. Is it, is it almost like chameleon-like? I don't know. Um, if so, why didn't they do it all the time? Or was that just designed for those guys? Was that a sh Because the following night, obviously, they had their UFO event. I mean, obviously, if we were going to talk about Humanby, we should have started three quarters of an hour ago, to be honest, David. <laughs> yeah, I'll get that. I know what you mean. But, uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying there, a lot of, I do hear a lot of um, things that are very similar to that, that things, uh, it seems like the mind can actually conjure these things up, or, or they, they seem to know what you're thinking. It, it's weird. I, I, don't, I don't get it. There's probably a bit of both in what you've just said there, David, you know. I mean, the mind can conjure them. It, it, you know, people who, I won't say, I, I don't want this to be taken as a sweeping statement, but people who, who, who lean towards the structured nuts and bolts, you can sort of, solid UFO, seem to see them. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. And, 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 and who's to say that they're not doing? Who's, who's to say that this is not some kind of hive intelligence, uh, that, that can adapt and bend to whatever we want to perceive it as? I mean, it, it might be, a, it might be a bit of a wild thought, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm beginning to think that, all of this phenomena is, like we've said before, is somehow connected. And the fact that we, we get the cat sightings reported in the same place at a certain time of year, there might be gaps in it of years, but we're getting the cat sighting. What's special about that area? What's special about off Bempton where these lights are seen? Uh, I mean, another interesting one, uh, while we're on with the, sh the, the sheep mutilations, for want of a better word, is that, uh, the, the, the cliffs there are two to four hundred foot, you know, very various places. And the shear. How does a seal get on top of the cliffs? Hmm. Uh, there's a, the, the, there was a seal on top of the cliffs, stripped of flesh. That's not that's not something that uh, an owl's going to pick up, is it? No, that, I mean? oh, even a even a giant eagle, I think, never try ever try well, picking well, a seal up. <laughs> we're, we're looking at something that's 150 to 200 pound in weight. Yeah. Which is sort of beggar's belief uh, how, how it's possible, but uh, that's that's what was was on top of the cliffs. I mean, I find it incredible, and ju like I said, w nobody knows how it got there. Nobody knows what was what's been responsible for the deaths of these animals. But just because we don't know doesn't mean that we should we we can't categorise it. That's why probably that's why there's been nothing on in the papers and nothing, you know, in the local news about them. Uh, because nobody's got a clue. No, and all it does is just scares everybody, and I think, well, we can't, we've got no answer for it, but uh, we're going to scare you anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as, uh, and we can't just do anything answer, about it. <laughs> well, just to answer the people that have said, oh, surely police would be involved, surely police know about it. Well, there you go. Yeah, they do. They're fully aware of it, but uh, they've they've not got a clue what's doing it. I can assure you, and uh, and neither have I. All I know is that we. We're in this area where there's a lot of unexplained phenomena presenting. And that's another thing, David. You know, in, in the second book, there's a guy, uh, who's walked. A lot of things start, Cliff Lane seems to get mentioned a lot. And that's simply because that is your only route onto the cliffs right. for most people. 
so they have to travel up Cliff Lane. But there's a guy in the second book that's walked Cliff Lane, depending on it, he's retired now, but depending on his shifts, it would have been morning or night, for the best part of 25 years. And he's got three stories to tell. That he's, and he's done that walk every day for 25 years. And my point is, because people are coming up to Bempton and Flamborough, and rightly so, expecting or hoping to see some unexplained phenomena. And, and I, I like to tell them, I'm not, I don't want to dampen people's spirits, but the chances are you won't. But, but then you sort of jump back with the sort of punchline that, I have to say, but you are in an area where there's a higher probability than most areas to see something. Because I can't think of anything that's not occurred up there. You know, there's been men in black sightings, there's missing time. And I spoke on Howard Hughes' show uh, in, on December the 18th, 2017. Howard had received emails and texts from somebody who'd been walking with two friends at Bempton on the 14th of December. So it was ironic that I were on the show. I, I would put me in touch with them as well afterwards. Mm. And uh, they, they'd lost almost two hours of time whilst doing the walk where this guy claimed to have seen this upright dog creature on this year on February the 7th. You know, what, same areas are throwing it up. I mean, and it's just it's just bizarre. And I know you've got similar things happening at Rendlesham. So you've got, you know, you Bempton's not unique, Flamborough's not unique. These, but they are highly unusual areas. I mean, I don't know what kind of phenomena you've got presenting at to Rendlesham, but I should think everything at one time or another has it. Well, I've heard several stories about from from giants to aliens to you know like greys and reptilians and there's, there's been all sorts so apart from the ufos i mean i've been in the woods uh in the mid in the in the sort of night time two o'clock in the morning with brenda butler who you you probably know um i know Brenda. yeah and we've seen we've seen stars that actually start moving and then stop and move and stop you know there's there was about four or five of us one night watching these stars uh, moving and stopping. So what <laughs> they were, I don't know. I've only ever seen one um, orb with my bare eye, with my bare eyesight, um, like a red orb. And um, Brenda saw it at the same time. She said to me, "Did you see that?" And I said, "Yes, I did see that one." But normally, my uh, the, what I get is uh, orb pictures with, um, um, for, with you know with a camera. Um, and normally, if Brenda takes them, she gets better results than anybody else, which is the amazing thing. She's got some sort of a a power that I think, what I call it, that she seemed to draw them, draw, draw in some sort of beings to them. And talking about yeah, that, now... And you were going to say Bill Rook, yeah. yeah I was going to say, have, you've had Bill Rook up, up your way, haven't you? Cause, he, uh, he, he wants to come up. I've met Bill several times, and uh, he, he's interesting, isn't he? He's a, he's a nice guy, he's, he's full of enthusiasm. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see what what happens when he comes up and uses his cameras, and just to see if anything does happen. Well, I'm, I'm not doubting Bill at all. No, I mean, he's got some ama- I mean, he's shown me, I don't know if he's shown you pictures and things, but he's shown yeah. me some amazing photographs that, uh, where his hand glows and everything like that. And he's got his book coming out himself, I think, hopefully towards the end of this year. So I'm, I'm hoping to get Bill on the show to at some point, around about that time when his book comes out. So, um, but obviously, yeah. I'll, we'll probably be seeing him a couple of times this year, anyway, a, a couple of me- at a couple of conferences, won't we? Um, so I believe he's coming to Chris Evers, uh, which I'll be speaking yeah. at on the 17th of August. I think it's August, isn't it? Forgive me, Chris, if I've got date wrong. I think it's around about uh, that time, yeah. Yeah, and then the, you've got your own conference. Yeah, you're uh, coming, are you going to come to that, Paul, I hope? Yes, yes, I want to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that would be good. And well, well we'd, we'd better tell everybody out there, it's the Colonel Holt Returns to Woodbridge Conference in Suffolk. It's on uh, September the 8th, if anyone would like tickets, contact me. <laughs> there's a few there's, there's, there's a few left but they are going sort of steadily and we've got a, well, we've got a little bit of time left before that but well I have to say David uh, you know uh, uh, praise to Colonel Alt to be honest with you and this isn't me sucking up if people think it is but anybody that got to listen to him at Chris Evers' conference last year uh, if you didn't get to listen to him then you need to get to David's because I was I'd seen him previously uh when John did the conference, uh, I don't know what year it was. It was, was. in 2015, when it all kicked off, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, but things are very, this is why the conference is called, uh, Colonel Holt Returns to Woodbridge, because it's kind of a different thing now. Um, yeah. it's kind of a, everything settled down, and, uh, I think what he was saying has been proven to be true, and everything like that, so, but a lot of new, a lot of new information has come to light. 
since he's written his first book. I, mean, I don't really want to talk too much about Colonel Hulk because this, this is your show. But well, no, I, I, <laughs> I don't mind. I mean, it's, it's not all about me. And I, just briefly to stay on Hulk, uh, I was amazed how sharp and on point that guy he was. Is, he's a, he's a, I, I mean, I, I like him a lot. You know, he's a he's a, he's a lovely man, and he, he, I. He, he can't remember everything that, that that happens 40 years ago now, but he does try to give his own true rendition of what he what he believes happened. You know, he doesn't come it, out with aliens landed or Cable Green and all this rubbish. You know, because it's uh, it's it is difficult though. You know, David. I mean, uh, to, to to get it right all the time. I mean, I had a spell last year where I was talking on radio shows pretty much every week and I felt uh, and I, I've turned some brilliant shows down just recently including Coast to Coast again mm. uh, but I will go, I will go back on for a minute that's not a snub I've just had too much on mm. uh, but it is difficult I found myself talking about Hunmanby on James Bartley's uh, show and I said that the, that Steve stood with the other two witnesses Dave and uh, Andrew watching the triangles and when I listened to it back I realised, I, I thought, what am I talking about? He didn't stand with Dave and Andrew. He was stood with two of the operatives from a unit t- further down. But so it is, it is easy to, 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 to get your story wrong, shall we say. And it doesn't necessarily mm. mean that you're lying. I mean, because once again, these guys have let me, I always, if possible, I ask them, I say, can I record you? Uh, you know, mainly because it helps when you're writing about the stories. So the, the Unumbi story is entirely accurate. I mean, the things that were happening, but once again, just to stay with Humumbi, in, in 1996, it started in June, and they thought it was uh, poltergeist activity. Uh, there were bits of wood flying around in the workshop. There were steel washers hitting the side of the workshop. The light, light bulbs would blow and the radio and the power would cut, yet the radio carried on playing that was plugged into the mains and it blew all the circuits, yet then they'd unplug it and it carried on playing. They attributed everything to poltergeist activity because they, they'd found a grave. When they were clearing the land, they found a wooden grave dated from the 1800s. So... These guys, they found a box, pardon me for saying a box, I don't mean it to associate with a grave, but they found a box to fit the phenomena in. Mm. But then it all changed, because it went from June, July and August of 96, and then it stopped. June, July and August of 97, and June, July and August of 98, and then it all changed after they saw the triangles, because a few nights later, they all had a, 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 a classic flying saucer sighting that was landed in the bottom of the compound at Humanby. Interviewed all three men separately. They've, they've not associated with each other for, one of them for about ten years and the other for about seven. Uh, they, one of them didn't even want to talk about it. We were only that I dragged the story out of one guy and he, he put me in touch with the other. Uh, and, they're all singing from the same sheet. They, they saw beings with people want to call them aliens, then let's term them aliens, but I don't know where they were from. The military presence. The, it, it's an incredible story. And I'm reaching out to anybody uh, who might remember any military roadblocks uh, in, around 1998 at, at Humanby, Bridlington, because we've already got a, ro- a roadblock in Hornsey which is a few miles away, where a triangle was seen flying low over some fields by a, a retired Coast Guard. And I think I wrote about that in the first book, way before I knew about this mm. story. And that's from 1998. And we've got roadblocks in Humanby the night that the flying saucer landed in the bottom of the compound. Mm. And, yeah, and, and that's exactly what this what Andrew says. He says, it was a classic flying saucer. He says, I can't believe it. He says, I think it was staged. He still does to this day. He says they were like a glass bubble in top and I could see this little thing inside it. He said, and I stood looking, he says there's all mist around it and lights. He said, and I, I saw Steve walking down towards it and then he didn't see him get taken. He says, but next thing he's not there. He said, and then I walked to the front of the unit. He said, and I opened the side door and uh, two military men dragged me inside threatened me, told me to stay where I was, and all three guys are telling a similar story, but interestingly, they were all working together, David, mm. in the unit, but they don't remember being with each other during that period of time. Oh. It's, it's, it, obviously, 
I'm touching on bits of a story that are probably sound a bit disjointed to anyone listening, and uh, maybe we can we can do hum and be start to finish at some point, David. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to have you back on sometime. Um, these, yeah. these military men were they actually in uniform or were they uh, you know, like high-ranking um, officers? They were, they were in black, completely dressed in black, head to toe. And somebody sent me some information recently. Uh, and, I, and I thank him, they call him Philip, I'll not say his surname, oh it's not Philip Mantle by the way Philip <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, so, it, oh Philip Kinsella, no, and he sent me some information regarding something that the late Tony Dodd wrote about with the these military guys who were in black, a special unit that were in black head to toe around the same time and, uh, excuse me just just to carry on with Humanby these guys worked on a night, this this was a second job, and they worked from about five o'clock to anything to three in the morning for three years, working on high-end vehicles, and they used to sign right vehicles and do fairground rides, and sometimes on a weekend they'd stay the night there. And Dave's, I, I briefly fit this in, Dave's mum and dad used to visit him, because he was the youngest of the guys working there, and they'd come every night and just have a natter with him and fetch him a few sandwiches and uh, on the way home this, the night that the flying saucer was seen in the and I'm going to call it a flying saucer because that's what these witnesses claim mm. it looked like um, they'd left at 10 o'clock and they never come back they left but after the events after everything had been happened because everybody the three men all got dragged back into the this workshop and the workshop's huge by the way you could drive double decker buses into it uh, and they all got dragged in by men dressed in black, armed and threatened. And Dave was dropped to the floor and pinned down and threatened and not to move. But after everything had happened, every, after everyone had gone away, or the, 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 everything had gone quiet and settled, Dave's mum and dad came back. His mum were crying, his dad were very frightened. And when they drove home that night, they'd been stopped by a military roadblock. Be it a small one, but they'd been stopped, taken out of their car and sat in the back of a black van where they were armed. We'll call them soldiers, but they're not soldiers in terms that we're looking at. I mean, there must be some special unit. Everything were black. Mm. And, and they were threatened, and they were told that they knew where they lived, they knew what cars they drove. Obviously, they knew what car they were driving that night. They knew, they knew everything, basically, about them. Then they released them, and they went back and, and told the son, and they told Steve, and they told Andrew, because all this stuff had already happened, they were warned not to speak about it. They, they're still alive, they won't speak about it. Uh, and Dave's asked his mum if she'll talk to me, but there's, there's no way she's going to talk to me. But the other three have, I've, I've, I've got lots more to get, I would say it sounds a bit, it doesn't sound right saying get out of them. I've lots more information to try and glean yet, but I'm, I'm really keen to see, Somebody must have experienced these roadblocks. Hmm. You know, I, I, I don't have to validate their story because I've been back to, to the Hum and Bee Industrial Estate and it's still small by industrial estate standards today, even 20 odd years on. And the, the bus breakers yard is still a few doors down from where it took place and some of those guys are still working there and they've backed them up. They've backed their story up from 20 odd years ago, from 1998. Uh, so... Uh, I don't mean it's true because they've backed it up, but I mean they've not seen these guys for years and years and I've just done a bit of door knocking. I've been to the actual unit where the, the event took place just, just to see if any other paranormal activity has ever taken place in that building because as I previously told you David, uh, you know we've got these steel washers flying about, light bulbs and there were money materialising out of thin air and pebbles dropping in front of them, all sorts of things, they were coming out to the vehicles on a night, this is in June, July and August of the three year period, the huge animal prints on the boots and on the roof and on the bonnets, literally huge but no dints, no damage to the cars. It, you know, this, the stuff that were happening, and this is why I was saying, David, uh, I think I think we've got to, we've, it's like a paranormal soup, I think we've got to encompass it all and mm. not, not, not stick our heads in one box and say, I'm a UFO researcher, so I won't, I don't want to talk to anybody who's interested in cryptids. Let's start looking and throwing nets a little bit wider and, and think, oh, me personally anyway, I'm, I can't speak for other people, but let's start encompassing it all. That's my yeah. look. Oh, I, I fully agree with you, Paul. I mean, I, I really, really do agree with you. I mean, if you listen to a few of the other shows, we, we have actually covered things like that on a, on a few of them. Um, a girl right. sell this roacher I had on um, a few shows back and she was telling stories about uh, people that go missing and, you know, pretty scary stories. 
But, uh, Do you know, and David, we, we've not even touched on, but that's the thing. These areas, the, 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 they actually, they, 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 they take in and throw out everything. We've got missing people at Bempton. Um, and believe me, I've been, I have been as, as respectful as I can be because obviously it's somebody's loved one. I've not talked mm. about them in any derogatory terms. I've not, I've not lumped them in saying that the, I think they've been taken by aliens because quite honestly, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, there's some people would want to sensationalize it and, and add them aspects in just because these are books about unexplained phenomena. Don't mean we've got to lower tone and, and somehow, uh, dis disrespect somebody's loved one, yeah. but basically, you know, we've we've got people who've gone to those cliff tops to to look at the seabirds, uh, such as a guy called Nigel uh, Simon Hodgson. I'm not, I'm not sure of the date now. I think it was 2014. Some he went all over the place looking at the wildlife and parking up, and a little bit eccentric, but other than that, that that's what he did. Parked at Bempton RSPB, never been seen again. Just, just never, ever, never been seen again. Uh, and a guy called Edward Machin, he he wanted to go look at the seabirds. He got a train to to Bridlington. Obviously, well, not obviously, but it broke down in Scarborough. A taxi dropped him off on Cliff Lane because the, the, he was seen on CCTV. Uh, and I've spoke to guy whose CCTV it is, and all that's been confirmed. It were not papers any role, but I've done that and uh, walked up Cliff Lane to the RSPB. Never been seen again. Seven days later, 16 miles up the coast, a guy called Nigel Savage is with with his dogs, two spaniel dogs, and he's gone to, to do a bit of fishing. Never been seen again. Wow. But uh, uh, that, but that's that's just the tip yeah, of it. It's There's, so scary, isn't it? When you think about it, that's, um... uh, you know, you, yeah, it, it really is scary. You know, I mean, then you, these people. I mean, the, from 2004, a guy called. Uh, oh, Good God, can't think of his name now. I'm sorry, listeners, but <laughs> uh, but he, he packed up to do a day's walking. Never been seen again. In between that, there are people that have had, uh, let's say, challenges in their lives and they've probably had relationships that have broken down and they've left a note and said they're going to end their life. And oh, yeah, sure. And then you'd find the bodies, wouldn't you? Yeah, you, and usually you do, yeah. Usually they end up further down the coast or they're on the rocks. And, and I'm sorry to make it sound like that, but the, that that's what happens... But what I'm saying is they're not, I don't mean, they are worth, they are just as important, these people, but they're not, they're not what I will write about. I'm only wanting to write about the people that seemed fairly well adjusted, that for want of a better word, have just vanished. I mean, I contacted the Missing Persons Bureau, uh, because you, it, it looks like a checkerboard of missing people. And I said, you know, and you've got these names, the names I've just mentioned, but there's about 9 to 11 of them on this board, on a board with probably 30 on, I don't know. And mm. I've said, you've got this person who's missed, gone missing and he lives in Hull. You've got this one in, in York. You've got this one who lived in Rickle. You've got this one, another one who lived in York. Uh, yes, yes. I said, but don't you realise they've all gone missing in Bempton? Yeah, and oh, we don't correlate that. We, we. Don't. I said, but you should be. And, and I've told police exactly the same. They're missing a massive trick. There's something happening here, and probably the reason. I don't know because they can't get their head around what is happening. It, I mean, it's the famous, not the famous, but the the, the usual thing in the, the newspaper article is uh, from some wife or or husband is why has my husband vanished off the face of the earth mm. and you see you, and that's basically what it's what they appear to have done these people no no intention of disappearing and they've just gone uh, it's 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 very sad mm. well, we've got uh, all his and family's left without any answers they, they've left with no answers and 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 the the places that i'm looking don't also i suppose don't help these people as well because i'm looking at alternative things that that most people uh i wouldn't say rational minded people because the, your listeners will, will be rational minded or i would like to think a lot of them are mm. but but they're not into this subject and they wouldn't consider that anything otherworldly could could be responsible i mean and until we know that it is i'm not going to hold my hand up and say it is either all i'm saying is they are they are disappearing and they're disappearing in an area where where these strange things happen. Yeah. Do, you, do you ever get any negative responses, Paul? I probably will now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously. No. I mean, do you, do you ever get people sort of saying, "Oh, go away, stay away from me," or something, anything like that? Um, I, I haven't done. Uh, you know, I've, I've had people they, they roll their eyes and think you're cuckoo. I mean. Uh, you, 
it's it's what it's amazing, you know, because some of these farmers are, are the the funniest. And I noted that after the big cat would, had been seen uh, on social media, he'd put a picture of his house cat and put a, a toy tractor outside of it, and mm. just trying to generate a laugh at somebody else's expense. Mm. But it doesn't it doesn't detract from the fact that it wasn't me. It weren't Paul Sinclair reporting seeing this big black cat. It was about eight independent witnesses yeah, sure, who you were just witnesses. asking the questions weren't you yeah. yeah so you know but but that that's that's the nature of the game and i wouldn't say you've got to be thick-skinned but you've just got to you think to, uh, and what's interesting as well is that the guy that actually put the picture of the cat i've actually spoke to his son and and got a ufo report off him years before uh, that landed on the road as he's travelling on what's called short lane between Bempton and Bridlington in the early hours of the morning i didn't put that on social media and as some kind of uh, insult and uh, you know th there's a, there's another little bit to it as well that the actual farmer who were ridiculing has actually had a UFO sighting with his ex-wife because she's told me <laughs> uh, she made a point of contacting me and telling me you know and so these people really it's not all of them but some of them are hypocrites I mean uh, you, but you can't please everybody David and I think providing you're, you're respectful about what you're looking into mm. be, the, be the missing people where it's got to be delicate uh, or, or, or somebody who claims to have seen a UFO or had some terrifying experience with some something on the cliff yeah. tops well, providing you, you you go into it with an open mind and try and judge the person then I think they're all worth speaking to yeah. I mean knowing you as I do I'm sure you, you approach with Hello? a gentlemanly conduct and um, you don't go in like a raging bull um, I, I, when I know you for a fact that you wouldn't do anything like that and you'll be um, sensitive to their feelings as well you're just breaking up a bit there oh, it, it, am I? alright I was, I was just saying oh, I could hear myself alright <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying that uh, I know you but knowing yep. you as I do I, um, you'd be very sensitive to their feelings and you're a gentleman uh, so you'd approach them uh, in a sensible fashion anyway wouldn't you hello you, oh, I think that's the only way to... Yeah, uh, hello, David. Uh, you can hear me. I think that's the only way we can be. I mean, you know, I, I know there's, there's, there's big egos within this subject, oh, but that's so that the same in anything. <laughs> but it, 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 it's the same in it's anything. Usually where, you know, it's anything. usually where there's money involved, Paul. Well, yeah, but that, once again, that's the same with everything, isn't it? Mm. You know, I mean... Uh, uh, and But I, I, I hope... I, I like to think I don't... I treat everybody the same and I, that that's how i want to stay and and, and i i really don't i don't want to be any different than that you know i'm not looking i'm not looking for sort of fame or or star and i just i just i've been me I, I, I quite enjoy doing i really enjoy doing the research uh i love it it's a it's a thrill i mean i'm this this week some this coming week a uh, cryptid researcher who you really ought to seek out is colin keelty and i'll be we'll be doing some really early morning uh yeah, put, uh, put, put, put you on to me, will you? And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make a make a date with him. Yeah, I will do. Yeah, Colin's. Bit, he's, he spoke on Vic Cundiff's Dogman Radio, and, and I don't know if anybody's ever listened to Vic's shows, but they they they're really good. I mean, you've got witnesses there from all over the world reporting things like what people are seeing at Flixton. Mm. And what you, and and just to briefly jump back to these these cryptids, you usually find that the people who've seen them. You, you find out second hand. You don't find out off the person. They're not raving that they've seen this thing in most instances. Then you have to go uh, tread gently and see whether you can get the story out of them. So they're not most of the time they're not volunteering these things up. The guy who claimed to have seen this creature on February the seventh of this year, he put those comments on. And uh, anybody who wants to go into Benton phenomena, you'll find them because I think we've okay. Yeah, I've got you. You know, through, um, yeah, because I'm thinking we're live. I apologise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, we're uh, all right. It's, it's, you know, throughout 2019, uh, th throughout 2017, for some, yeah, the, for some reason, the American military were up on the cliff tops, And w obviously, as I've previously said, I didn't find out about the animal killings, the animal deaths, until New Year's Day 2018. But it had been going on all throughout that year. Hmm. And we'd got these... Dodge Ram pickups with this big green unit on the back with the dish uh, and a big generator and they were on the cliff tops they were around the area where all these things have been seen where the where, roughly where the animals have been mutilated where the porpoise were being found 
and obviously you can't link A to B, but it, you 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 start you start start to think to yourself, you know, there's probably some connection. There's, it, are they showing an interest in this? I don't think they're responsible for mm. it. You know, social media at the same time are also reporting a hum. Uh, a, a very, very subtle humming sound and people on social media were reporting hearing it all around Bridlington and East Yorkshire. I'd heard it myself and I think it were coming from the generator of this, um, this military unit mm. that were up on the cliff tops. Now I don't know what it was doing and we've got to understand that we're in an unstable world and it could be nothing to do with this paranormal aspect sure. that we're looking at. But it, nevertheless, it is interesting, and interestingly enough, the military vehicles were seen again, I think it was two weeks ago, and Steve Ashbridge uh, told me he'd got a bit of, I think it was some pictures of them, and Andy Ramsden had seen them as well, I've not seen them. Hmm. Anyway, I think, what was our communication problems, Paul? I think we'd better leave it there, because uh, I've got a little bit of chopping around to do. <laughs> Okay, but, David. Um, well, I, I, mean, I certainly would like to get you back on again, perhaps in a few a few months. We've got these um, conferences coming up. Um, yeah. I think the, the 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 awakening conference where you'll be doing a presentation. This will probably go out after that. So, but people will hear it anyway because it's going to be on podcast yeah, and it's... YouTube and everything. But well, well, but if anyone wants to actually come and see you, you'll be appearing at um, the Pontefract uh, Outer I'll, Limits. I'll be... Yeah, I'll be appearing at the Outer Limits Conference uh, on uh, August the 17th, yeah, I believe. I'll be seeing you there, but I'll be seeing you at the Awakening as well next week, so uh, yeah. so I'll be seeing you well, three times this week, and you're lucky. I mean, oh, it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't think I'll be seeing Chris Evers at the Awakening, because uh, I, I know he wanted a lift, but with the people who've appeared in the documentary for us, such as David Hind and Andy Ramsden and, and Bob, They've got tickets, and we're, we're just limited with, with room ink card, you know. Ah, oh, right, yeah. But so, I, I, haven't, I haven't actually spoken to Chris for a while. I'll have to get in touch with him and see what he's up to. But I, th I think we're all ready. I don't know what the setup is for talking at this. Yeah. Uh, I think he's been qu quite involved with um, with Philip Mantle and the uh, the alien autopsy. <laughs> I, I read I read the comments. Yeah, I, I, I sort of amused me. Hilarious. <laughs> It's, it's good, isn't it? But, uh, you know, I mean, you, what you, what do you, what you find you do, David? I mean, I don't know about you, but you, you find it consumes you if you get oh, too involved in yeah, it. Yeah, you know very well how, how something's consumed me for the last three or so years. <laughs> yeah, but haven't you had that you, no, I don't mean away from it, but you've, you've cut it back now. Mm. Oh, definitely, yeah. You know, you must be better for your health as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, since it's, I've uh, been doing this show, it's helped me quite a bit, because, um, I'm able to speak to people, not sort of making anything out of it or anything, but it's actually, um, it's been nice, you know, because there's a lot of nice people out there and there's only, there's only a few rotten ones that uh, you come across and uh, most, yeah. most people are nice and, uh, you know, there's, a, there's just a few bad eggs in the basket that really need sorting out, you know. Well, I think you've been on that case, haven't you? So you're, uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever you're doing. Keep doing. Yeah, trying to, trying, well, I mean, I think things are coming to a head now and finishing, so let's just, just hope so anyway. But anyway, Paul, it's been great. <coughs> excuse me. It's been great talking to you. Excuse me, excuse me listeners. Uh, I've, had, I've had a bit of a sore throat this uh, last week or so, so excuse me, coffee. Um, anyway, I'm going to have to say goodbye, Paul. We've got a bit of communication problems here. I'm going to have to sort it out. <laughs> but um, no problem. anyway... Uh, listeners, you've been listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network and Paranormal Dimensions. I'm David Young. You've been listening to Paul Sinclair. And we're going to say goodbye. And thank you, Paul. And come back again, please. Thank you very much, David. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care of Bye yourself, now. Paul. And thanks for coming on. You're Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left.
Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network.